Thanks, Tammy. Okay, hi, everybody. Everyone can hear okay? All right, great. Um, and you're all here for the full day, yes? That's super, okay, because I'm going to have it all continue and flow. And uh, I'm going to spend the morning teaching you how to predict that a bite is coming. And uh, most of the afternoon uh, teaching you a little bit on how, uh, handling-wise, uh, how to uh, avoid it, communication-wise, how to avoid it, and uh, then finish up the day with what to do if you're being bitten or attacked. Um, the only question I will not answer well, because uh, I don't have an answer for it, is how the best way is to break up a dog fight. Everyone always asks that, and I'm like, it's the number one way people get bitten. And uh, so, I don't have a great answer for you. Except that I can tell you that if it's a serious latch-on, head-shaking dog fight, water will do nothing. Um, so anyway, but I'll, I'll, get to, I'll get to all that. And I want to start out teaching you nothing. I'm going to show you some video clips, very short, um, well not very short actually, um, but short video clips. Um, and I'm going to give you the outcome of the dogs that you're going to see. The video clips are from part of my assessment, which is Assess a Pet, and it's just the first um, less than two minutes of the first procedure, which looks for uh, sociability. And I won't, I'm not going to really define anything for you, for you. I'm not going to teach you anything about body language to start with. I want you to just watch the dogs, make whatever observations you can. And you have to match up the outcome with the dogs that you're seeing. I'll give you the scenarios. And then um, at the end of the morning, I'm going to replay the uh, videos. And puts, you know, it's like a money-back guarantee, but really it's not money-back guarantee. But hopefully you'll uh, learn things that you can then see in the video that you didn't see to start with. Um, and I'm from the shelter world. I'm also from the training world. But um, most of my work is with shelters. And in the shelter world, we are just, we often don't have an owner we can ask about the dog. The dog has to tell us everything. And we're often in the business of predicting what the dog could do next. Um, and then we have to be able to sleep at night with whatever decisions we make. Um, and so the more, the more we can see what a dog is telling us, the better. Um, so that's, that's what I'm going to that's what I'm going to do to start with. Um, and then uh, I'm going to have some demo dogs. We, we tried to get the most obstreperous, um, blithering idiot, large, out of control. And at first, Stina and I, Stina said, she doesn't really have, like, maybe one. And it's so, like, whenever you want blithering idiot, obstreperous, out of control, you don't have them. And whenever you don't want them, you do. Uh, but anyway, I'll do some uh, actual handling for you as well. But I want to spend the morning teaching you to, um, if this is an aggression threshold for a dog, this is the, the point in this continuum that goes up and down. If this is the point where he'll actually bite, um, down here is a relaxed, friendly dog who has no, you know, he's so far away from his threshold. And many dogs, the best pet dogs living with real people, live their lives down here and they never hit an aggression threshold, or it takes so many things happening at once to push the dog close to threshold. There are a lot of dogs that live pretty much all the time close to threshold, and then there are a lot of dogs who, when you meet them, are, are right at threshold, right below. And um, by the time a dog is snarling, growling, snapping, biting, or mauling, it's obviously too late. There you are. There's the aggression. You're at threshold. I want to give you a lot of this stuff here. Um, and I also want to give you some of the mid-layer mid stuff, because the more mid-layer behaviors that you see, um, that's going to also stack up and push the dog up toward threshold. So I'm going to give you all those things, uh, which I think are really helpful. And then I'll talk about communication. What I will not talk about today is how to cure aggression. And I don't actually think we cure violence thresholds. I think we learn to manage it and um, provide the dog with this uh, as much of his life lower than threshold that we can, and then ways to redirect him or um, teach him other things or simply just try and manage him to get him past things that hit him at threshold. I don't, um, 
I don't really see it as curable because everything alive has an aggression threshold. Each one of us does, and you know, it takes different, um, different things and different scenarios for any single living creature to become violent. Um, and most, thankfully, most humans as well, don't ever become violent. Um, we can get angry, but that doesn't mean we're violent, you know, and um, dogs are the same way. Um, so I don't think we cure that. Everyone's got it. I think we try to push the threshold a little farther away or keep the dog farther away from his threshold. Okay. Now, I'm going to sit here and um, let me uh, need to figure out how many of you are from the shelter world? How many of you are uh, from the professional dog training world? How many of you are dog daycare or boarding? Boarding, okay. Um, daycare people get bitten a lot. And then you can't convince the owners of that. That's always really hard. <laughs> yeah. Um, and how many of you are vet techs or veterinarians? That's a population I think should always come to this too. Okay, <clears throat> that's great. Now, let me decide which scenarios to give you. D, 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 D. Okay. Two of the dogs, two of the dogs that you're going to witness were, um, these are all shelter dogs. They were placed with regular, normal people. That means the people that don't spend their lives on a Sunday at a seminar, they don't even volunteer at a shelter where they just want to handle dogs. Real people are people who um, love dogs, want a dog, and own one, but have other lives, and they usually have kids, and they usually have neighbors, and, and whatever. And so both the, two of the dogs were placed with real people and follow up at uh, one of the dogs, I have follow up, it's about two years, two and a half years, very successful placement. Um, no dog has never hit an aggression threshold. Um, and the other one I followed up just over a year. And um, uh, again, very successful placement. So two of the dogs are what I would consider, if this is, if this is threshold, uh, okay, they're, um, they're way down here. And, um, the best pets live way down here. They don't, need, they don't need somebody to constantly manage and thwart and watch the dog and not let them look. And, um, okay, one of the dogs has already been returned for knocking down an elderly woman. And you can decide whether you think it was just a, you know, an accidental strong dog and you know, a stupid old woman who got in the way or whether you think that there was some aggression involved. Um, and, um, and a, a fourth dog, uh, about a week after the um, footage that you're going to watch, mauled a volunteer at the shelter um, and bit her multiple times on the hands and arms um, and required serious medical attention. So the, those are two, two dogs, successful pets with real people. One dog returned for knocking down uh, an elderly woman and one dog mauled a volunteer on the hands and arms. Are you ready? And the one I'm going to add, because it's very relevant in today's world, um, it's a dog who has been returned five, uh, eight times or recycled, meaning um, it's, he's not been returned to the same facility and gone out, um, which is just considered return. Recycle is my word for he's been adopted brought to another shelter, or adopted from a rescue group who disbanded and then it gets to a shelter. And this dog has done eight different circuits, okay? Which at some point, one has to say it's a cruelty to animals to, to have that kind of, and to every, every single person that tried. People, people try and they feel like a failure. Um, so anyway, I'm gonna add that. So one dog returned, eight, recycled eight times. Mauled a volunteer, knocked down an elderly woman, two successful placements, okay? Okay, here's dog number one. And again, um, most of what you're gonna see, there's four steps to the sociability test. The first one is stand and ignore the dog for 60 seconds. And it's just observation. Um, 
the Assessiped assumes all dogs that you're testing have been in the shelter for at least four days. And that's because at least uh, two studies that I have heard of said that um, the cortisol levels or stress hormones drop back down to normal after three days in a kennel. Um, I know that they go back up, I guess, is what I've heard after a while, but what are you going to do? You know, they're in the shelter. A Cessipet doesn't penalize the dog for arousal or, um, you know, it expects to see certain things that your own pet dog, if I went to your home, wouldn't show because these dogs are coming out of a kennel situation. But anyway, 60 seconds of observation, three uh, strokes along the dog's back in, a, in the most non-threatening part of the dog's body. Then the tester sits in a chair and still says nothing, um, sits in a chair and we're observing for five seconds what the dog's behavior is when the human sits. And the final um, test is the uh, tester can finally socialize back with the dog. And so the tester will um, smile, uh, offer warm uh, verbal praise, cajole the dog over, pet, stroke, um, and that lasts a full 20 seconds. I'm not gonna show you all, I'm gonna show you just relevant parts of the clips. Okay, dog number one. And most of these were sent to me. Um, they're not, um, not necessarily um, me or my footage. And a lot of these were sent to me for recommendations on handling. So don't look at procedure as much as the dog. I identify this dog as a, a sort of a pit coonhound mix. And I know you don't see coonhound, but eventually with his ears you will. Those are coonhound ears. And in uh, all, these, all this footage, there's at least two people in the room, one behind the camera um, or more. OK. So we identify this dog as the pit, pit coon hound cross, OK? Sear, sear that into your brain. And um, we will c compare and contrast. Here's another, um, another pit mix. And whenever you're tempted to say something like, oh, well, the dog's not doing anything or he's not doing very much, just remember that they're always doing something. And uh, if you're not sure, like if you're panicking over an interpretation, you're like, oh, I have no idea if this is the good dog or the bad dog or whatever, just start narrating what the dog is actually doing. And um, that often helps. Okay, so that's dog number two. And can we actually um, close those a little bit more? 
I know in this footage it has sunlight and you, you want to block the sunlight in the footage, but you um, Okay, uh, dog, number, dog number three. This is uh, going to be uh, the pit greyhound mix. And what are some things people are observing? It's always easier when you have dogs to compare to the first one. The first one, usually, like, I have no idea. Uh, what are some of the things you guys are noticing? So somebody said worried. So describe the behaviors that you're seeing that make you interpret it as worried. I am not disagreeing with you. But what I'm, I'm going to make you guys do is point out all the behaviors. So what makes you say worried? OK, so looking around. Okay, tail down. Ears are back. Very good. Tense and describe what tense looks like. Okay, rigid. These things are very hard to describe, but I'm forcing you. That's what I want you to do today. Because if, if D says, oh, well, it looks worried, um, or it looks, you know, or I think it doesn't like people, or something like that, you can take that interpretation and say something like, oh, well, she's afraid of greyhounds, you know, or, oh, she doesn't like greyhounds. But if you said, you know, the ears are back and the tail is down, everyone sees that. Um, everyone can agree on, on that. Um, so anyway, here, I will continue. And I'm, I'm talking to a group. This isn't a scientific assessment. OK, so that's greyhound mix. So the first dog was coonhound pit bull mix. And I'm making up the mixes. I have really no idea. Um, at, at my shelter, if it looks enough like a pit, that some pit mix that somebody else is going to call it a pit mix, we'd like to do it beforehand so they don't adopt something that they think is just a pointer mix, and they go to the vet, and then they're horrified, and, you know, even though the dog is great. So, and if it's a nice dog, we, don't, we would like to say it's a pit mix. Um, so anyway, um, but I have no idea of these dogs. I didn't do any DNA testing. And so the second dog was the black and brindle, the sunlight clip, and this is the uh, greyhound mix, okay? So now we're going to continue and... Um, Go on to, this is dog number four, listed as a white speckly cattle dog mix. I really don't think there's any pit in this dog. What are some observations? Okay, a low wagging tail. Good, and that's the uh, base of the dog's tail compared to the plane of his back. Yeah. Say it again. I didn't. Lots of eye contact. Okay. Okay, ears are up, and uh, curious or furious? Curious. And so, what was the difference? Um, 
because you said the greyhound mix was look, observing his surroundings a lot, and you say this dog is curious. What's the difference? This one is not as focused on everything, okay? They go up, but they go down. Okay, his body's a lot softer, but what does that look like? Yeah, oh, and, and not that this helps the video, but I always watch people's gestures, particularly clients, when they're talking about their dog or describing behaviors. And the, the thing is, um, people will innately imitate what a dog is doing where they can't verbally say what the dog is doing. And that's, that's every single person on the planet, myself included. So I always watch what people's hands do as they describe things. Um, because it's, it's, that's, anyway, that's just body language. Um, okay, so that was dog number four, speckly white cattle dog mix. And the final dog, a terrier mix. And I know you think, pit bull, but no, terrier with the coarse, wiry hair. Or nowadays, um, it would be a doodle mix, right? All the doodles come in with the coarse <coughs> hair. But uh, in the olden days, we used to say <laughs> terrier mixes. The pre-doodle, pre-doodle earth. It's like a giant Benji. We'll list him as a giant Benji. <laughs> so give me some observations. Lip licking, okay. Looking at the door. Oh, is it who? Okay, little, very little interaction with a human. Uh, chosen this dog standing somewhat behind. Almost looks like it was trained for heel position. Yeah, it's not. But um, and and she said looking for security. That's an interpretation. I'm not saying I disagree with it. But it's, he doesn't seem to want to move anywhere, is what she said. Well, let's just say he's, is he, he's not moving, is he? Has he moved his feet in the last 40 seconds? No, he has not. And that's a, that's a reasonable description of what we're observing. And it doesn't mean we know what it means. So is movement good or bad? Somebody said bad, somebody said good. Depends. But um, some of the dogs have moved a lot, and some of them have not moved very much. And um, we'll uh, describe that. I will teach you. Somebody said a whale eye, which is when you see the whites of the dog's eye, but I'll get into that. So this person says definite stress signals. And uh, somebody said a hard eye. Hard eye and soft eye I find really hard to actually describe to people. But um, stress signals we'll get into in a sec. Okay, so, and this is dog, dog number five, the terrier mix. Review dog number one, the coonhound pit mix. Dog number two, the brindle and black pit mix. Dog number three, oh, the Greyhound. Ah, see, this is me and my new MacBook Pro not getting along. Greyhound mix for cattle dog mix, and then five was Giant Benji. Okay, now I'm going to ask you to make some votes, and uh, I won't remember like who you are if you're worried, like, oh, I didn't get it right, or I have no idea. Doesn't matter to me. I haven't taught you anything. Um, so how many of you, let's take, um, let's take dog number one, coonhound, pit mix. How many of you um, think he's one of the two successful adoptions? Raise your hand. One of the two successful adoptions, okay? A couple, a handful of votes. Um, how many of you uh, think he's the one that mauled the volunteer in the hands a week after the footage was taken? No votes. 
Um, how many of you um, believe he's the one who knocked down an elderly person? Okay, at least uh, probably two-thirds voted for that. And how many of you think he's been recycled eight times through the system? Nope, okay. So, dog number two. Black and brindle. Um, pit mix. How many of you think she was one of the f um, two successful adoptions? About a third of the votes. How many of you um, think she uh, uh, mauled a volunteer a week later? One vote, not a very confident vote. Kind of like. um, how many of you um, believe she's been recycled eight times in the system? A couple of not very confident votes. Raise a hand like that. And how many of you believe um, she knocked down an elderly lady? Okay, I would like to say that I can tell many of you didn't vote on that one. <laughs> okay. I don't know who didn't vote, but I know that not enough hands went up. All right, so you're not confident on that one. Um, our greyhound mix. How many of you uh, vote? This is one of the two successful adoptive adoptions placements. Okay, one vote, two, a couple votes. How many of you vote? This is the dog um, that mauled a volunteer a week after was taken. Probably about a third, third of the votes. How many of you believe this dog's been recycled eight times? And uh, another third. And how many of you vote um, uh, knocked down an elderly woman and was returned? Right? It's hard. It's hard to, to figure these things out. Um, the cattle dog. How many of you vote was one of the two successful uh, adoptions? Okay. Probably just about 100%. How many of you vote uh, she was um, mauled a volunteer a week after this footage was taken? Nobody. Oh, one person. Okay. How many of you believe the dog um, has been recycled eight times? A couple votes. What's that? For the heck of it, she's going to vote. Thank you, because that was a lonely category. Um, and how many of you vote she mauled, uh, no, I said that, um, return for knocking down an elderly woman, did I just ask that? Return for knocking down an elderly woman, one vote. And uh, did I go through all the choices? Thank you, it gets so hard. <laughs> and um, finally, giant Benji. There he is. And uh, how many of you vote he was one of the two successful placements? Okay. A couple of very unwilling to vote Peter, people. Um, how many of you vote uh, uh, he was uh, a mauled volunteer a week after the footage was taken? About a third. How many of you vote he's been recycled eight times? Oh, majority. Majority votes. How many of you vote uh, he knocked down an elderly person? No. Okay. Very good, and I, I'm not going to tell you till the end. So you have to stay. It's like when they say, <laughs> see the news at 11, that you can't leave. Um, and I did this in St. Louis recently, and this poor person, I, w I gave them till the end of the entire day. And uh, she had to leave early, desperate. She's like, please, can you, just, can you just tell me? I was like, you sworn to secrecy. So I will get back to this now. Um, let me first, I am going to give you the Sue Sternberg gross simplified categories of aggression. And today I'm talking about aggression directed towards humans. It's a completely separate issue for me, um, aggression directed towards other dogs. But I'm only talking towards humans. However, and you need to listen carefully for this, a lot of the footage I'm showing of aggression is between dogs, because it's a lot easier to get that footage than it is to hang around and wait for a person to get bitten, and then not to help them, but to just film. I, I can't do it. Um, and so when I show you footage of dog-dog interaction, I just want to make it clear that it has nothing to do necessarily that the dog is human aggressive, and um, uh, I don't, I don't there's not often a correlation between a dog aggressive dog and a, and a human uh, dog to human aggression. Um, and oh, and I'm going to show you one of my categories for why people get bitten is a dog is resource guarding. And I just want to say very specifically that I think dogs guard resources with other dogs 
completely, um, completely separate issue than when they guard it to humans. And dogs who guard it, uh, resources between dogs often have no aggression uh, resource guarding with humans. I mean, sometimes they do, but there's no correlation, okay? So let me ask you the first pop quiz of the day. Um, I'm gonna be showing a lot of dog-dog aggression footage, but what are we talking about today? To humans, okay, but I'm, this is where I have footage, but I'm telling you, we can learn so much from dogs. They are the, the communicators, and so I watch my dogs and I imitate them. Not, you know, I don't get on all fours, I don't growl or bite, but in terms of how they try to avoid getting bitten. Beautiful, beautiful dogs, to, uh, things to learn from. Okay, so my first category for common reasons why people get bitten or get themselves into trouble, and that is guarding resources. And um, in guarding resources, probably the number one thing, oh, the number one item that dogs guard are humans and owners. Number one thing they guard. And I think a lot of stranger aggression, you know, aggression towards um, strangers on the street who approach, uh, aggression toward guests and visitors and workmen, I think a lot of that, a component of it is the guarding the owner. And I'll show you um, behaviors that clue you in for resource guarding. Um, and that's really useful in terms of how you handle yourself because you don't want to cut off the dog's access to his resource. That often triggers it. I am going to show you, um, the first clip is, um, no, I'm going to quickly go over the categories and then I'll show you the clips. It's so exciting. <laughs> uh, so resource guarding is one and um, arousal is another one is why dogs bite. They hit uh, a state of high arousal and many dogs, the fastest and best way they have found to calm themselves down is to bite and it, it's like putting a pin in a balloon. And um, arousal issues are really common in shelters. Like you walk one dog down the kennel aisle and that dog hits a state of arousal that most dogs would have an aneurysm, you know, um, exhibiting. So arousal issues. I think um, dogs who bite when they um, are highly aroused, I think those are your most damaging, often your most damaging kinds of bites. So I think it's one of the more dangerous forms of aggression. And if you don't um, handle yourself well, it can be a mauling, um, a, really, a really bad attack. So arousal is, a, is an important issue. Um, and this, this one I call um, meeting a challenge. And I think that's a stupid name for it, but uh, it means you are either inadvertently or sometimes deliberately, which I don't advise, challenging a dog. And you often do that with your body without realizing it. Um, or, or this is done when you discipline a dog, try to discipline a dog, or use um, um, force or uh, punishment, but you often get aggression during those moments. And I have, don't worry, I've got footage of all these. Another very broad category is stranger aggression. And it's most often fear-based, almost always. But um, dogs are never cleanly in just one category. They pull from multiple categories to complicate your life and your diagnosis and your prognosis and your treatment plan. But most aggression directed toward you know, visitors, guests, people approaching on the street, most. Um, the major component of that is fear. Um, so I'm gonna talk about that separately. I lump it all together. And this isn't, um, this isn't aggression, per se, but it's a predatory. Um, I use it as a category because while it's hunting behavior and not aggression by the scientific definition, when you get bitten because a dog's in his predatory motor pattern sequence, it hurts and can send you to the hospital. And so therefore it meets my definition of aggression and handling and observation. In other words, there are um, dogs who are very predatory and, um, and it's a category I definitely want you to observe because you can trigger it differently than other 
other types of aggression. And I think that's the last category. Okay. And again, this is not like you open up the, the, the book of knowledgeable dog people and these are the categories that you would find. This is like Sue Sternberg, how she makes her categories and goes through life. Um, so with resource guarding, I'm going to show you, this is a clip. It's between two dogs at a dog park. And um, one of the dogs is a red Doberman and the other one's an Alaskan Malamute. The Doberman is a young adult, I believe maybe one to two, maybe three, I don't know his exact age, neutered male, and the Malamute is an 11-month-old female. And um, you'll see the Malamute's owner in the footage as well. God bless you. So here's the Malamute, and there's the Doberman. And they were playing at the far end. There's the owner of the Malamute, and there's the Doberman. Oh, right. Now, that happened fast, did it not? I, I'm filming, and I'm like, whoa. And it's done. That's true aggression. By the time real aggression happens, our, physiologically, we're just starting to process it. Um, dogs process things much faster. They can respond and react faster um, than humans ever can. And that's not a skill to be acquired. That's us as are the limitations of our species. And I'm going to show you that in slow motion. And what I'll point out is the Doberman avoided the first bite, where the first bite was directed. He avoided it because he was fast. We just don't want to know what's on the ceiling. It's like a Stephen <laughs> King novel. Um, oh, well, it's the sun. That's what they call it here in Idaho. <laughs> Things that crawl on the roof. Oh, it's the sun in the rafters. It's closer here. Um, the Doberman avoided the first directed bite. If it were you and not the Doberman, you never would have been able to get out of the way fast enough. And I, wanna, I really want to make that clear. Um, and that's not a matter of, like, if you just practiced, you'd get faster. You can't respond. Um, I mean, the entire aggression little bite in there lasted, I think, a second, not, not even. Let me show it to you in slow motion. And the Doberman is kind of nervous around other dogs, and he's kind of awkward. And the Malamute at the other end, where they came running from, they had been sort of playing, like the Doberman was engaging her, and she probably wasn't, I don't know, relaxed and playing, but he, he, I believe, is my interpretation, I feel like he thought he found a friend, and he, you know, he comes running through the park with her, and I think he's like, I've, I've finally got me a friend, and um, so if, um, if this is the dog, this is the Malamute, and this is the owner, um, where is the worst place to be if the dog's a resource guarder? In between, right. But the Doberman, honestly, I don't think he's thinking any of these things. I think he's thinking, I've got me a friend, I'm going to poke her in the ear and lick her, and then maybe she'll chase me again. We had so much fun at the other end. And where is, where is she aiming for? Yeah, the carotid artery. The, um, yeah, and that's, um, this is very serious. And again, she misses him. That is not because she intended to miss him. I'm telling you, she intended to get him there. Um, she misses him because he moved so fast, because he can, he's a dog. However, she gets him. And she, um, look at that. She's 11 months old. And um, she ends up ripping his flank open. And it goes off camera. I was filming. I have no one to blame but myself. And here's the situation. It's a dog park in Colorado. And I, I needed, I, I had five minutes of spare time in the town I was in. And I knew they have a dog park. Five minutes. Five minutes. And I needed photos for an, an article I wrote for the Association of Pet Dog Trainers Chronicle, and it was a, an article on dog-to-dog -dog aggression and, and behaviors. So I was just going to you know, put it on burst and go film anything at the dog park, because I figured I could find a category for it. 
And so literally, I step into the dog park. I am there not five minutes. This occurs. The owners of the Malamute check the Doberman's neck all over. And they say, oh, there's saliva, but there was no bite. And, and the Doberman owner's way in the back. And everyone goes on their merry way. And it's like, everything's fine. Nobody worries. The Malamute people left that part of the park to go into the separate, another part of the park. I followed them. And, um, and uh, I look over through the fence at the Doberman who's moving around and I see um, this, all this pink flesh on his side. And I said to the Doberman owner, I said, you need to check your dog's side. I said, I really think he was um, torn. And the guy gets up and he's like, oh my God. He goes, thank you. And he packs up his Doberman and he starts leaving the dog park. And he says, I'm going to go to the vet. And I said, yeah, that'll certainly need stitches. And um, he's leaving, and he's not telling the other, the other owners. And I'm, I'm horrified. And so I said, aren't you going to tell the, the people with Malamutes? Because it's information. I'm not blaming them, but they need to know that. And they wanted to know. They checked the dog's neck. And he said, oh, no, 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 as if this happens. And um, so I went to the people with Malamute, and I said, I said, the man is leaving with his Doberman. I said, his flank is totally ripped open. He's getting stitches. And they said, oh, are you sure it was our dog? <laughs> I said, yes, I am. <laughs> um, um, so anyway, that uh, is resource guarding, the owner. And that is a, um, it didn't take much for that Malamute to hit threshold, OK? She was um, spending a lot of time here in terms of dog-dog resource guarding. and. Um, once she hit threshold, dogs um, are, are born and made, but a lot born, I think, with, like, I think you nurture what nature gives you, but you have to depend on what nature has given you. And I think how violent they want to go, how much damage they end up doing, is a good part nature and I believe your bond and how much you've bonded to the dog and shown him a good time and blah, 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 will also keep his uh, violence down. Um, but that, that dog, especially at 11 months, she went quite far her, um, for hitting threshold. And that's certainly her first bite to a dog. Um, I had talked to the owners. Um, but that is a very uninhibited uh, event. And the placement of her original bite was on the neck. And that's not a good placement. Um, yeah, I'll repeat the question. Don't worry. Would it have been better if the owner hadn't put her hands on the dog? Well, probably, but she had no idea this was coming. The Doberman had no idea it was coming. Um, and what I'll tell you is um, people do that. I mean, she has every right to pet her dog. In fact, I think it's a great thing when an owner connects with their dog at the dog park. Most owners are just chauffeurs. Um, and so I thought that was great initially. Uh, and what I care about, and I'll spend most of the afternoon teaching you not to get in the position the Doberman was in, and also how to predict that that's what she was doing. All right, so uh, let me show you some more resource guarding. That was kind of a, a big event. This is a, um, a quick snapshot of a, um, this is a, uh, this is a dachshund and um, a sort of fluffy mixed breed. And uh, the owners are sitting, uh, not, not paying direct attention, not that they should be. They're not in any way irresponsible owners. Um, and the dachshund, this is a bag here. And apparently, there's something edible in the bag, or at least the dog thinks there's something edible in the bag. And so the dachshund, and it belongs to his owner, her owner. So she's guarding it. And this dog sort of wanders in. And um, so the dachshund has every right to say, and, and she gave warning. She said, listen, she's hovering over it. She's like. She goes, this is my bag, and you need to back off. And the fluffy dog says, well, I think I want what's in the bag. And um, the resulting uh, episode, there was no, um, no damage, no stitches done. And part of that is with small dogs, there's a handling technique I call the elevator. And in particular, when a dog's wearing a harness, you can just <laughs> <laughs> elevator him out of the way, which you can't really do with a Rottweiler. But anyway, here, here is the event. Woo! There is the elevator and in slow motion. And again, the dachshund is very clearly saying, 
and, and is claiming ownership. She was here first. Um, she's hovered over it. And this dog is saying, well, I hear you, but I want it too. So this dog is actually the one who triggered the dachshund to go further, because the dachshund's saying, listen, you back off now. I'm not going to say anything. But the fluffy dog says, I don't think I want to back off now. And again, I never know these things are coming, you know, until after the fact. And there, do you see how the fluffy dog is hanging in there? Yeah. She didn't turn around, she started snarling back. And now the dachshund says, well, that is not good enough. And then she goes in there, grabs some hair and an eyebrow. <laughs> no damage done. There was no, uh, no harm done to, between the dogs. And, um, that is so much less aggressive than what you saw with the Malamute and the Doberman. And the reason is, they were communicating. And the Dachshund very clearly said to the fluffy dog, I will not bite you if you back off now. And it was the fluffy dog that said, I think I could win this possession. And so that aided, aided the conflict. There is no, nothing wrong with either dog. The Dachshund is a lovely dog. Dogs often get blamed for that. Um, the dachshund was perfectly appropriate. It takes two to tango, but they were communicating, right? Not making the best decisions, but they were absolutely communicating. The most serious aggression is when one, um, one dog directs it to another being, and it doesn't matter what the other being does. The other being will get um, violated. Um, so that is also... Um, now watch this communication. And um, this, is, uh, this is a home. This is Tina Louise. She's in this, so she's about a six or seven year old Catahoula, a spade female. And this is her home and her couch. And this is um, um, Peter, who owns this dog, calls this toy the dental dam, because it looks like you know, what you get at the dentist. Um, and this toy has been lying around the house, completely ignored for probably two months, gathering dust. But, there's a red coonhound mix here, and my friend came to visit with her two dogs. And so the coonhound is a female visiting the house. She doesn't live here. And she's younger. I think she's maybe three years old here. And she kind of wants the dental dam toy, all right? And so uh, this is their communication. And watch how everything, all the problems are avoided. This is going to be beautiful communication. There was no growling, no growling, no noise. This is just, she spit it out. It takes a lot of confidence to spit out your resource. It's the way, you know, you back off of it, and what you're saying is, I'm pretty sure I can keep this, even without it in my mouth. And um, again, that's not aggression, that's just confidence. She's hard staring, this one. Is this dog frontally hard staring or challenging? No, she actually has her, her head averted. She really wants the toy and she wants to see if she can get it. And she's not really snarling. She lifts up her lips a lot when she's uh, swallowing. And what's amazing is she actually looks away, which one would think is a sign of weakness, but it's not. It's, I think it's just another way of sort of confidently saying, if you want to try to take it, go ahead, but um, you just you won't know. And I liken that um, growing up, my parents, um, you know, they, were, they never used physical punishment or anything. And basically, I, I worshiped my father, and I adored him as a child as well. And um, the worst thing he could do is show disapproval of me. That was just so horrible. And I, I worked to get his admiration and, and his... Um, and so if I disappointed him, that was like the most horrible punishment. But he had, he had a threat, and... Um, that he would use if we, my sister and I got out of hand, and he would say, I'm gonna call the Hadassah. And he described the Hadassah as this horrible monster. He never described the monster. This is when we were very young. But um, he would say that if we didn't start behaving, he was gonna go to the phone, call the Hadassah, and the Hadassah was gonna come over. And again, we had no visual on the Hadassah. It was just our imagination, but the Hadassah monster was something god awful. And I grew up, of course, to find out that the Hadassah is like a Jewish women's group in New York City. <laughs> <laughs> it 
but I didn't know that at the time. You know, you could hear the word every once in a while in conversation. And the worst that ever happened, he once had to start walking to the phone. Like always, he would say, do I need to call the Hadassah? And we would stop. And one time, I guess we didn't. I remember it was my sister didn't stop. She's older. So he walks to the telephone, and he goes to pick it up. And she burst into tears and screamed, no, no, don't call the Hadassah. We'll behave. Um, but anyway, I like to think that the dog, when she turns her head away, she's saying to this dog, do I need to call the Hadassah? <laughs> And again, there's some blinking, very slow blinking, which again is very confident. You don't take your eyes off things, just like, I'm going to call the Hadassah. And the dog's thinking, hmm, I think I'll leave. She says, this is unwise to stay here. Um, again, this is a food bowl guarding, and uh, this is where we think of resource guarding. Um, this is during a, a, a food bowl test. And again, you know, a lot of the little subtle signs are freezing. That was a little freeze in there. Um, and uh, other, other things, uh, an increase in the speed of eating, which shows competition, that leaning. Yeah. And uh, if I show you just the... Um, most dogs, when guarding a resource, will bite whatever is the closest threat. In other words, they'll bite the closest competitor and they'll usually bite the part of your body that's close unless they have another agenda. So in this case, we use a fake hand, uh, thank God, because this dog bypasses the hand and goes for my um, body. So hang on here. No, not growling at all. She made no sound. She made no sound until she did this. And I actually don't even know if she made sound during it. Again, see how she's bypassing the hound? She's going for my legs. And she only bit the hand because I shoved it into her mouth. Um, I would have handled it certainly differently if I had no hand. I mean, if I didn't have my fake hand. Anyway, um, and again, uh, at, at the shelter that she was at, by breed type alone, before they did any assessments, she's listed as, you know, a retriever mix or a lab mix. By breed type alone, they would have placed her with a family with young kids. And uh, you really have to do it uh, for behavior. This is a seven-month-old um, border collie. Again, um, this is resource guarding. There's a long freeze, a very long freeze, tongue flick, whites of the eyes, snarl. And the dog is guarding a fairly large area around the resources which is important because it's obvious when there's a food bowl down there that you shouldn't go in there. But when a dog is guarding a steak that's on the counter or on the grill, you don't think that's the dog's item. Um, or, you know, the dog is guarding it, but you don't necessarily know that. And so I'm going to teach you how to look at a lot of these subtle signs because it's obvious. You're like, well, I'm not going to go near that dog when she's eating. But... Um, Why are you uh, pulling the hand in and out? And what's the handling? So I'm going to describe that. This is a, that's a test uh, for an assessment before placement. And with a lot of shelter people who are very experienced with dogs and very confident, they'll go up to a dog in a shelter who's chewing a bone, and they'll reach right in, take the bone, or pry open the dog's mouth and take it out of the dog's mouth, and they'll say, see, he's not a problem at all. I can just take this right out of his mouth. Well, that's not the same communication that children give dogs, and it's not the same communication that first-time owners or people who, are, who don't know the dog well will give. And um, you can get away with that kind of brutish, overconfident, you know, of just give me that. Like, I mean, if my dog has something and I'm going to go in there and take it, deeply internally, I'm walking up to the dog going, I'll kill you if you even think of guarding that thing. I'm just going to, you know, take it. And I... I project just utter confidence. And when you don't, um, or with some dogs, even who are resource guarders, they won't use aggression on you because it would sort of be crazy. They think you're crazy. Look at the lunatic coming right in here. He's going to take this away. Good God, I'll let her have it if it's that important <laughs> to her. Um, and so when I do an assessment, I want to do things that trigger um, average dogs in the home. And that is they get petted or somebody says hi to them, 
they're licking out the dishwasher and the dog's guarding the dishwasher, but you don't know that, and then they turn around and they bite. Or the dog's sitting near a counter where the chicken is uh, cooling on the counter, and uh, somebody goes to hug the dog, and it turns out the dog's guarding the chicken. Um, but the hand placement is the hesitant communication that real people, and in particular almost all children, will do with a dog. And it's, um, it'll, it's what triggers uh, most aggression. It's not unfair, and it's not teasing. It is most common. And it's one of the ways, you know, like in a shelter, we're trying to assess a dog for, for average people. We're not trying to figure out what the dog's like in a kennel with professionals. We know that. He's fine. Um, this is a, a resource guarding a stranger. And um, the man's coming in and offering his hand. And I'll describe why the behaviors here indicate the dog is resource guarding and is not aggressive over um, uh, out of fear or other things. So, and I'll get back to that dog if you remind me later. And um, here's a little resource guarding clip, and I'm filming. It's between my seven month old new dog and my 13 year old blind in one eye bitch. And um, the bitch is um, she's 13 and she's, she, uh, she has the disease that I call snarcolepsy. And it's most common in females. And snarcolepsy is non-damaging uh, um, uh, snarking or teeth showing, growling, snapping, sometimes skin grabbing another dog when it gets too close, usually to an owner or food. And, um, uh, snarking is what we used to call it, and so then I decided the disease should be snarcolepsy. And what I want you to, to first of all, the, the puppy is not, um, remember like the fluffy dog and the dachshund, the puppy is not backing off. However, he's also avoiding any, any bite, and he seems to know the other dog's not going to bite him. They are guarding me, I'm right here on a chair, B, the older girl is sitting with me on the chair, and Jean is pushing. Pushing, pushing is what he does. He's a pusher, subtle. And she's snarling, do you see that? And he's like, here, here's my jugular. <laughs> so he looks away, right? At first he's, he, does, he does just enough to avoid aggression. Like if she looks towards him, he'll look away. If she looks away, he'll move his head towards her. And he's trying to diffuse. He's, there he is, like I wouldn't think of going near mommy. And B, she moves away, he moves in. Right, and then she looks at him, freezes, he's, and he turns around, he's getting closer. She's snarling now again, and she's not making a noise. She licks his eye, that's, that's, the, that's the trying to confuse him and me. <laughs> Oh, she says, I'm not done. And she has found, um, she doesn't understand Jean. Every dog prior to this that I own, um, and she's not, she's now the queen, but she was the, the lower one. She was the last to arrive for a long time. And she never tried anything with the other dogs that were over her. But um, now that she's the oldest bitch, she loves to do this with the other dogs. And she's just hideous, uh, snarking all over the house. And the other dogs will walk away, and the, my other cattle dog grovels. And unfortunately, Jean has come in and perplexed her because he knows she's not actually going to bite, so he just takes it, and she just doesn't know what to do with herself. <laughs> she's like, damn it, this should work. Oh, this should work. Look at my face. Look at my face. I could kill you. I, I could kill you. What's wrong with you? I, I, I could kill you, really. I'm... And so anyway, these, um, it, doesn't, it doesn't end. <laughs> now, he knows, um, he figured out when he walked in the door at 13 or 14 weeks from the shelter, 
he figured out that she was never going to connect with him, so he is unfazed by her. And I don't know where that'll play out when he turns into an adult. Um, I want to show you, these are some clips of dogs avoiding aggression. And again, I'll talk about it this afternoon, but this is absolutely a dance between uh, partners. This is all about space, taking and giving space, and distance. And if there's a proper distance, usually the distance you start at when the dog hits a threshold, if you um, push into that space, you'll get more aggression. If you pull out of that space, the dog's usually giving you the opportunity to retreat without aggression. And um, if these are heads, you know, your head, dog's head, or two dogs, the dog that makes eye contact, this is now um, here, and this dog now, this is a plane. The dog can cross the dog's plane. And you don't get aggression here. You want to avoid face-to-face. Face-to-face is when you get most conflict. Um, and so dogs will do this dance. You saw it with um, the puppy and B, the snarker. She moves her head away, he moves his head in. She moves her head back, he moves down. And then after a while, though, he's like, she's not going to do anything. And she's like, what's the matter with you? What, what the hell is the matter with you? Gah! And, but she never heard him. Um, and so these are, uh, this is B, again, B. Um, and this is younger cattle dog, Yeoman. And this is Yeoman's favorite toy. It's a cloth uh, frisbee. My friends like to call it the little toilet seat cover toy. It's a ring, a, a cloth ring, and she really wants it. And she knows that B is a hideous snarker. And so um, I want you to watch the, the play of, of movement and, um, and uh, between them around that resource. So there she is, oh, I want it. And then she's like, whoa, but she's sort of staring now. Hmm, whoa, I'll back off, but I really want it. I'll get low. No, uh, she's not looking now. I'll go in and grab it. I grab it, oh, it's so slippery. I'll grab it and I keep dropping it and shoving it closer to her. I would like to just pull it away. Oh no, now it's even closer to her deadly face. So um, very clever here. Um, she goes over and knocks over the coffee of my friend. Her, so as she's cleaning up the cup and then she acts cute and she, she makes the friend go get the toy. She says, no, you go get it. She won't guard from you, but she'll kill me. Kill me if I go over there. And then, um, but then she can't, she's just a, a clumsy nightmare and she can't get out of her own way, so watch what happens. She finally has the, the toy, the toy she has wanted. She is so happy and she's far from the snarker and life is good, life is great. She's got a new friend and um, look, the friend is coming over now. This is awesome, I get loving and hugs and I have a toy. And then, um, then just keep, keep watching. I may have to fast forward. Oh, and she says, like, heavy blinking, this is great, I love this, I love this, and the toy, I think the toy she checks is still in my possession, <laughs> but let me, uh-oh, she notices that B is moving a little closer, and she says, I love this, but I'm going to need to go check on my item. It goes on and on, and there's B, <laughs> and now she's like, oh, okay, isn't that clever? I'll lie down on it, it'll be my butt, it'll look like an accident. And then watch. Great. Oh, she goes, thank God. But then watch. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. It, whoa. Oh. And again, all of that is avoiding pushing into the dog's bubble. All right? And um, that is the number one thing I'm going to teach you in terms of avoiding aggression. Okay. But that is resource guarding. And... Uh, Let's look at arousal biting. Um, and the first, uh, the first few clips I have of arousal, uh, one is dog to dog, but it's actually a human that gets bitten. Again, this is a dog park. Um, and dog parks are just amazing um, places to go, not just for dog to dog bites for footage, but dog to human bites, apparently. It's been, uh, it's been a great boon to my wanting to collect footage of people getting bitten, which I don't really want. And so the circumstance uh, here, uh, these are two people, and uh, there's a, a Pomeranian and a, an English toy spaniel, and they've been playing and playing and playing and playing. And this is a, 
uh, I think she's an eight-year-old um, pit mix, and she has seen them from the distance and gotten kind of stimulated. And they were playing really in a way that would stimulate a lot of dogs, but it happened to trigger the pit mix. And she's now grabbing the neck and just poking and grabbing and grabbing under the, the bench. And I actually, I usually don't intervene. I ask people if I can film, and then I just observe. But this is one of the times I intervened, and, and I, I said, excuse me, excuse me. I said, the white dog. I said, I don't think she's playing. And she, it took her a bit, took me a while to interrupt her. Excuse me, excuse me. What? Oh, thank you. Oh, thank you. So I said, the white dog is not playing. She had gotten um, stimulated. And um, now, the worst thing to do, of course, is to pick up a dog. <laughs> but however, what do you, what'd you say? Put the dog on the ground so it can get killed? This is the dilemma of the small dog person. They're always told, don't pick it up. You make it more enticing. Well, hello. Pick it up because it's going to get killed faster on the ground. And the only risk to picking it up is that you'll get bitten too. And most owners would take a bite to keep their dog alive. And so she picked up the dog. She has every right to pick up her dog. Um, it does stimulate uh, the other dog, especially in a state of arousal. It'll stimulate them more. Um, but again, you know, what are your choices? Oops. And uh, I'll show you the point. The uh, woman gets her finger bitten. Um, there's the owner. Uh, wait, let me go back. I'll show you. Um, at the first bite, the woman gets her finger, bite, finger bitten, and she says, oh, ow, she says, that dog bit my finger. And in there was her finger. And it didn't draw blood, or at least she didn't show anything anyone. But there she goes, ow, ow, the dog bit my finger. But you see how this dog is in a state of arousal. You can't, you can't interrupt her, you can't, you can't connect. It's, um, it's too difficult. Now watch this dog's uh, state of arousal. And again, uh, this dog is triggered by another dog, but a state of arousal can be triggered by anything. It can be, um, you can be walking a dog and um, past a, a children's playground, and the dog sees the kids in the distance and starts getting aroused, and they get into a state of, and, and I'll describe it, um, dogs often then will either redirect, in other words, they want to go after the thing that's in front of them. When they can't, they'll turn around and bite. And I'm going to show you a way to, to sort of gently test to see if the dog is going to be the turnaround biter. Because a lot of dogs don't turn around and bite. They're just happy straining and lunging at the thing they want to bite. Um, and other dogs who are aroused will start jumping up at you. And they'll start um, nipping and using their teeth to, to nip, to grab and pick at your clothes in a high state of arousal. That's most common for shelter volunteers in the shelter to, um, in, to get that behavior triggered. Um, and again, I look, I, I, um, in terms of arousal, I'll look at the dogs when, it, when I first see it. And I'll give it a, a number, a one to 100 number. I'm just going to designate it a, a state of arousal, in my opinion. And so I would say this dog, who was already up, ears forward, muscles tight and tense, I would have given her a 60 to start with. And then I say to myself, where is her arousal going? And I would say, it just spiked to 75. And then I would say, where is it going? It's continuing up. It's not, um, that is a freeze frame of her barking. And you can see it once I freeze frame it for you. But again, so this dog's state of arousal from whatever number I gave her, and you could have given her a 30 to start with, but you would have seen that that number spiked. And when that spikes, you're in danger. And you're in danger of a couple of things. One is you're in danger of the dog starting to come at you and, um, start jumping up at your face um, and biting. And the second thing you're in danger of is the dog turning around to bite what he can grab onto. And uh, one of the things that I do uh, in particular, I don't know if I've got it. Um, yeah. Um, when the dog starts hyper-focusing on something else, usually another dog, 
um, I will gently touch it somewhere on its body. And dogs, um, often on the top of its head or on a shoulder, dogs who would turn around and bite into you when they can't get at what they want to, almost always will flick their head. And uh, Dr. Emily Weiss, who created the SAFER test, I first heard her use the word head whip. And it's a quick um, head movement, and they point their muzzle um, usually at your hand or at you. But it's the little head whip that tells me that I should be really careful and keep my thighs out of the way or calves out of the way because that dog has, uh, can turn around. And so what does she do when I touch her? Nothing. You were writing. I'll, I'll show you again. I rewind. I'm rewinding, rewinding, rewinding. Okay, ready? So what does she do when I touch her? Absolutely nothing. So the risk of a redirected bite is lower on this dog. It, I'm not saying it won't happen, but she's not a head whipper. She's a, a state of arousal um, directed fully forward. And uh, this is a pit bull that, um, and I'm not picking on pit bulls. I use footage of behaviors. Whatever breed they come in, I will show. And the reason I do that is I treat every dog as an individual, which is why I would tell shelters to assess their dogs for behavior and not make decisions based on breed type. Don't euthanize ones you think are bad, and certainly don't put in with families dogs that you quote unquote think are good. Um, every dog's an individual, and um, so I treat them that way. But a lot of the pit bull people are like, oh no, don't show another, you know, don't show another clip of a bad pit bull, and it's like, these are dogs. And right now, um, pits and pit mixes are making up the majority of dogs in shelters all around the country. There are a lot more of them. And uh, so anyway, this is footage of behaviors. And um, however, arousal issues, very common for dogs, um, for pit mixes and the bull breeds. The type of dog-to-dog -dog aggression they were bred to do is not, they're not status-seeking other dogs. They're not mean with other dogs. The dog-to-dog -dog aggression that has been bred into them is literally um, the pit pit bull fighter people call it igniting, like striking a match. They're looking for that dog to just, boom, see another dog, no matter what the other dog is doing, go in there and fight until somebody dies. And, um, and so they're, when they're also aggressive with humans, it's this um, ignition of arousal that you're looking for. It's not uncommon in pits. Certainly it's not in all of them. So this is, um, it's a dog-to-dog -dog test, and I'm going to show you what happens. So she sees the other dog who's there. And none of this looks horrifying in terms of dog aggression. And it's not. What's interesting is what happens to her. She wants to get to the other dog. I don't let her. And so then she will turn around, frontally face me, mount my leg, and then she gets into a state of arousal. It was. It was literally, I would have given her a 10 or a 15 to start, and she went to 100. And it was straight up, directed completely at me. The footage makes it look like nothing. Um, it, was, it was, she was snapping and grabbing um, up here, so she was in, she was definitely trying to bite. And again, there it is, she wants to go here. Not yet, that no, doesn't happen yet. And now she's at a hundred. And there she started biting. You can't see it. It's all directed at me. I, I want a helmet cam, I've decided, so that you can get my view of the dog as well. Um, it was really serious, and I, I had to cut off her airway. And it looks like nothing. I mean, if you, it, you know, go ahead, you know, don't go ahead, but if you put it on the internet, people would be like, I knew that Sue Sternberg, you know, she was aggressive and all the other awful stuff you might want to say, but um, the dog triggered and uh, into 
it was disciplinary to me, right? She's saying, I want to go there. This wasn't a redirect. This was, you know, a cursing out. Why aren't you letting me go? And is it fair to hold a dog and not let it go to another dog? Well, yeah. Yeah. And what if you're stopping and you're asking directions to somebody? Or would an owner get in a situation where they're holding a dog and not letting it go to another dog? Of course. Um, it's, it's good information to know, but that was, um, and I'll talk about handling for that, uh, um, that exact situation in the afternoon. Um, one more, I think two more categories, stranger and meeting a challenge, predatory. I'm going to give you a break now. Don't get up and don't rustle yet. I'm going to tell you how long you have a break for, and then when we come back, I want to, um, I want to talk about how to, when you inadvertently or deliberately challenge a dog, how you get aggression then. And um, um, stranger aggression, because if you're a, a, a behavior uh, counselor, you do private in-home consults, or you do daycare, um, you're the stranger to the dog, and so you're at really great risk of stranger aggression. It's a um, huge, huge risk. Um, so I want to definitely deal with that. And then I want to talk about uh, predatory behaviors which I think uh, I'm seeing more and more of, and I want to I want to talk about how they're triggered and what they look like in particular. Um, so take a 20, 20 minute uh, break. Certainly go outside and enjoy the sunshine and uh, enjoy the two stalls for the women. All right, see you in 20. All right. Oh, can you hear me? I'm really loud. I'm very loud. All right. And um, am I too loud? Okay, well, I'll speak. Um, I want to I wanna continue uh, showing you some footage, and I'm going to give you some details of behaviors. And, and then there's a, a lot of dogs that uh, I'm going to bring in as uh, demos, and they sound very exciting and very um, varied temperaments. So, and I'll talk uh, handling. I'll probably do most of that after lunch, but uh, we never know how far we'll get. Um, and the next uh, category, again, I, I, hate, I hate my my names for things. Meeting a challenge, I think it's more um, creating a challenge. and. Um, but again, very often a dog is doing his best not to bite. Not even very often, almost all the time, dogs will do whatever it takes not to bite. They are amazing, absolutely amazing animals. Um, and it's usually the one thing we do, and, and we're like, oh God, why did I do that? That can uh, provoke a bite. But um, so sometimes we accidentally confront a dog and get bitten. But other times, we're deliberately confronting a dog in some way, because either we think it's the right training method, or we think, um, uh, I remember I was, at a, um, I was at a music camp in the Catskill Mountains. I was there in, as a fiddler, not as a dog person. But the director of the camp came and got me, and he said, uh, we need you. And I said, oh, well, you know, is, is there a fiddle emergency? No, I didn't say that. Um, <laughs> And he said some of the campers went um, hiking and they found a Rottweiler, a male, and, and so it followed them back. So they found a rope and they tied it to a tree and gave it some food and water. And, <laughs> and um, so yeah, um, and the problem is they called animal control and the, the dog control officer that came couldn't get near the dog and he couldn't get the dog in his truck. So they called me over. And uh, when I got there, the dog control officer said, and what he said was the definition of why he couldn't get the dog in the truck, but he said, he says, yeah, I don't know what happened. He goes, he says, I looked him right in the eye to show him who was boss, and he wouldn't let me near him. And so you don't look an animal directly in the eye. Um, and it's not about winning or being the boss. Really, it's, it's not about that. It's about um, keeping dogs lower uh, off a threshold. 
and not, not creating so much conflict in them that they have to bite or they feel like threatening. Um, and uh, so anyway, that was his, that was his uh, problem. I mean, it's also harder if you're a stranger and you have to approach a dog um, and the dog has any issues with strangers, whether it's fear or just offensive aggression, it's usually easier to be a woman. And again, um, dogs who are afraid of strangers are always, almost always more afraid of men than women. And it's not because they've all been abused by men. It's because men are larger in general. Um, men have deeper voices in general. Men tend to greet upright and frontally, um, it, which is uh, a lot more challenging. Um, like if I was going to greet Alta here, um, if, it, if it were me going to greet her, I'd, I'd go like this, oh, hi, it's so nice to meet you, you know, how are you? And uh, most men, and, and I'm, I'm not like, this isn't whatever chauvinism or anything, it's sort of sociologically different, tend to greet frontally and upright with the eyes, head, and spine in alignment. Hi, how are you? And it's just, I don't know whether it's as children we're taught to do that or whatever. Women, we tend to gesture, and um, anyway, it's very different, but if you're a dog, you will certainly be more set off by somebody who's coming at you frontally and direct rather than softly. And the other thing about um, being afraid of strangers is the more varied the strangers are, the harder it is to get used to them. And women, we all shave our facial hairs and put head hair on. And men come in every single variety of head hair and facial hair. So it's much harder to get used to men than it is women, who are more consistent in what we want to look like. And um, men tend to wear hats and sunglasses more than women. And that also changes things. So, but, um, so it's, it's sometimes easier. And, and then, of course, you know, a dog control officer, the guy that was at the music camp wasn't in uniform. But to top it all off, if you're a guy with a beard and a hat and you're big and you have a uniform, you're doomed. You're doomed. Um, so let me uh, show you a couple things. This is, again, at a dog park. Um, and it's a, it's a human, a uh, dog to human bite that I captured. Um, there are actually a few of them. And the, the situation is, I want you to, um, there, there's a black dog that I want you to uh, observe. He's the one that does the biting. Um, and he bites this guy, who is uh, provocative. Um, he knows that the dog, I guess, has issues, and so he's trying to provoke it so that he can in his training method, he's going to um, discipline the dog for aggression, which to the dog is another form of aggression. Um, and I'm, I'm not saying anything about it, but again, this dog is trying not to bite, and the bite comes from um, the body language of the person. And so this, the situation is there's two cavaliers playing madly with a tennis ball that's under his foot. And so... Um, it's in kicking the tennis ball that he um, ends up provoking the black dog. Oh, like this? Okay, that's good. Um, so again, here's, here's the black dog. It, it doesn't belong to the guy with the tennis ball. And they're the Cavaliers. That, that sir, that's my ball. <laughs> Sir? <laughs> and so that was the first um, weekly attempted bite. This dog, let me rewind that a little um, further. This dog does uh, a lot of his aggression with his body. And he'll use a chest slam. And a lot of dogs don't actually use their mouth in aggression as their weapon of choice. They'll use their body and either body slam or knock over. And it's a form of aggression. But again, oops, sorry. If you watch the black dog, there was, he jumped up at the guy, and I'll show you in slow motion in a second. It occurred when the guy was frontal and aligned and in, intruded on the dog's space. 
And right here, would you say this dog is looking to go bite somebody? No. no. Does he have a low threshold for aggression? Yes. But he is not looking for trouble. And what he is doing, he's looking right up at the guy, and what he's looking for is what the next move is going to be from the guy. And when that, when that happens, when a dog looks up and is looking at your face, the first thing you better hope for is that you didn't choose that moment to look at the dog, because you don't want to be looking directly at the dog. You can see him perfectly well if you're looking down or, or off to the side. And the second thing to understand is this dog is communicating. He is under threshold, he's reaching threshold, but you have um, an ability to avoid the bite, to bail out, depending on what you do. And again, in kicking the ball, which belongs to this dog, and again, remember the bubble, the bubble of space, and there's a jacket rip. I don't know if he pierced his nipple or not. Men don't tend to undress and go, oh my god, look at my nipple. It's been <laughs> pierced by a dog. Um, but the, I think the jacket was torn. But again, most of the body contact is made with the chest. And, uh, and then the dog will get disciplined. And again, discipline is physical discipline um, on some dogs will be the point where you get aggression. And Physical discipline, like that was a deliberate, I'm grabbing the dog by the collar, I'm going to pull him up and I'm going to probably yell at him. Or there, there's the other thing that used to be common in dog training, grab him by each side of this, this, the cheek or neck and pull him up and shake him and yell at him. And um, those are sort of typical forms of, of um, discipline, punishment. And it'll work. In, I mean, if, if your goal is that the dog not bite again, it won't work because you don't change an aggression threshold by meeting it over and over again. But, um, you know, certainly raising your voice in, in, to a dog, like in your home, I raise my voice to my dogs. If they're heading for something or I need to stop, I'll be like, hey, cut that out. Um, and they'll stop. And to me, I feel like that's effective or whatever. <laughs> and, um, but, um, so this guy deliberately bent down, and he didn't get bitten then. However, the dog bit him three more times um, for approaching him like that. So the dog's not learning not to do that. And if he did, he would only give up perhaps doing it to that man, but he wouldn't generalize it to other people. Um, the dog is, is pushed over threshold when somebody physically confronts the dog. And to me, the dog doesn't look fear-based. Um, I'm sure there's a little bit of anxiety in there. The dog just looks like, you know, stop it. But he is certainly not, this is not a dog looking for a fight. So you think, oh, well, I would never grab a dog by the collar and yell at him. And that's fine. Here's another example, though, of, um, of discipline where you get bitten. This is my story. Um, I uh, used to run a boarding kennel, and so I was uh, boarding a Chesapeake Bay Retriever and belonged to a family. They'd been boarding the dog for years, never had a problem with the dog. They never told me there's a problem with the dog. And um, I have her on a leather slip lead. I'm getting her to the car. I'm going to drive her back to her owners. And it's really early morning, and it's pouring rain. And um, I was sleep deprived and stressed. I didn't want to have to drive, so my thresholds were down. And um, it's pouring rain, and I've got my sneakers on. And if I step off the concrete path, my sneakers will get wet, and they will be wet and soggy and stinky the entire day I will have to spend with my wet sneakers. Doesn't that make you feel like crying? Just awful, right? But anyway, that's what I'm thinking. Oh, no, I don't want to get. And the dog is dragging me, like the worst kind of sled dog, just like ah, ah. And I'm trying to stay on the concrete path. And um, I got annoyed, and I said to myself, I said to myself, hey, you learned dog training in 1981, and in 1981, if a dog was hauling on leash, we'd give him a little leash correction, a little tiny pop on the leash. And so you can't ever 
completely squelch what you learned first. So I'm going, and the dog's annoying me. And I gave a slight jerk on the well, thick leather noose lead, not a chain collar or anything. I gave a slight jerk. And it's stupid, right? All I'm doing is releasing my own anger. I'm not going to train the dog not to pull. She doesn't pull for the owner. She's only pulling because she's leaving the boarding candle. All it was was me getting rid of my irritation. So I give her the jerk. Here I am, right? And here's the timing of the event. Dee, 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 bing. And then by the time I noticed something had happened, the dog was coming off. And what she did, she, in an, in an instant, was in the air, Chesapeake Bay Retriever, going like this, rah, 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 and spit was flying in my face, all her teeth, right here. And then she went right back to pulling. And that's when I noticed that something had happened. Um, honestly, I didn't even register it till it was done. And then I was like, OK, you can pull. <laughs> but, um, and that was me sort of yanking her for no good reason except to release some of my own energy. Um, and I learned from that dog, without scarring, uh, never to do that again. However, if I had been walking her on a loose lead, and she were walking nicely, and all of a sudden she decided to try and haul me, or try and put, and she went wham, and she had hit the end of the leash, I would have probably gotten the same discipline. She does not know that a sharp jerk on the leash was deliberate or not. She's in, in front of me. And so when I'm handling, and I'll talk about this and demo this this afternoon, I make sure that the dog can't hit the end of the leash in a sudden burst, because dogs will turn around and discipline whomever he thinks uh, caused it. So again, this is causing aggression, which we often do in our lives, accidentally or at times deliberately. Um, now this is footage of me with a um, nine-week-old mixed-breed puppy from a shelter in Massachusetts. Um, and the puppy, if this is an aggression threshold, the puppy was always here at threshold, all just at threshold. It was very abnormal, um, snarling, uh, biting, growling, guarding, um, turning around, not puppy mouthing, whatever. And I'm, I've been with this puppy, I've been doing some demos, and somebody in the audience says, well, I think the puppy's only doing that and behaving that way because nobody told him no. And so I explained that, um, first of all, your aggression thresholds don't go where they are because somebody wasn't a good leader or not. You can, um, I think dogs are more, are more secure and content and can relax better if you're a good leader, if that's what you want to think of it, you don't become a good leader by physical discipline or by um, dominating. You are a good leader when you show the dog a good time and they see you as the access to fun and they admire what you do and what you do with them. So it's part of the bond. But um, for the sake of the people in the audience who felt like somebody just had to tell the puppy no and she would be fine, I said, OK, I'm going to give the puppy an old-fashioned leash correction, which I probably wouldn't even have done in the past on a puppy, which is you take the leash, you yank it, and you yell no and look him in the eyes. So I'd like to show you, again, this was a demo because somebody believed that all you had to do with this puppy was sh tell her no. And um, she was at threshold. When she would bite you, she would clamp down and tug you to the ground or head shake. Very, very high levels of aggression. I do a whole workshop on puppies and de define mouthing versus a low level aggression and whatever. And I'm not going to do that here. Suffice it to say, though, none of this is um, normal puppy mouthing. This is, um, this is all a disciplinary uh, bites on the part of the puppy. And I've been talking, and she's been doing this. So now somebody said, um, so I was talking to them, and I was warning them what I was going to do. I suggested if somebody didn't want to see a leash correction on a puppy, they would look away now. I'm explaining all that. Then I needed to get her to bite again so I could give her the correction while she was biting. So here I am trying to get her to bite. <laughs> so how effective was that?
yeah, it only stopped her to focus and organize her. She had previously to that been unorganized aggressive. So she's, you know, thrashing around, you know, not breaking skin, doing some yanking, grabbing, biting, showing that she has low thresholds. But what you need for serious aggression is that, that narrowing of focus and the organization of all of it coming together and the dog going, now I am ready to bite. And if I show you in slow motion, And so she didn't want me to pet her. She grabs my thumb, and it's a clamp down. And here comes the correction. No. Do you see how she took space? If it had worked at all, she would have lowered and gone away. What she did, watch her muscle up. Because here I came in to take space. This is an aggressive move on my part. And she takes space from me. I start backing off. She hard stares. And then lunges for what part of my body? My face. Previous to that, what part of my body had she been biting? My hands. If you had a choice between a hand bite and a face bite, let me tell you, the hand bites are less embarrassing than a face bite. And um, so, usually, uh, aggression causes aggression. Confronting, thinking that you need to win, thinking that you need to show a dog who's boss, um, are ways to push a dog over threshold. I think you need to project yourself as being big, neutral, and confident with dogs. And I'll show you how to do that in the afternoon. But I do not think you um, need to dominate them or challenge them. Although I do think it's important to be a good leader. I think dogs need to understand that humans have opposable thumbs. It's our house. It's our rules. It's our earth um, in terms of what the technology and how we function. And they will need us to keep them safe. And I think we sh they should feel that we are there to um, make sure that they're safe and that they have a really good time while they're on the planet. Um, so stranger aggression, again, very often based in fear with other things mixed in. Very often worse when there's a barrier present. The barrier is a leash, is the dog in the car, um, dogs are usually pretty hideous in a car when other people walk past. It's a, an area of bad behaviors behind a fence or in a kennel. Um, and so barriers, uh, barriers add frustration to the mix, and frustration will lower the threshold, so push the dog closer to the threshold. And uh, frustration is also arousal, which um, does that. So this is yet another dog park, grasshoppers. Um, and the man in red is uh, part of the park, a park service, and he's cleaning up trash on the outside of the park. And for a, a jaw-dropping, absolutely appalling 20 minutes, I watched and filmed this dog charge, lunge, growl, bark, and go after him behind the fence. And I would look around. There were only a handful of people at this small dog park. And I said to myself, I can't even figure out who the owner is of the dog. And she was completely non-responsive to the dog. I feel like what the dog was doing was abusing the man. It's absolutely abuse. I also um, I know that practice makes perfect. So I don't care that he can't get to the man. He hasn't bitten him. It's a fence. It's, you know, no damage was done. But boy, next time a man in a uniform walks past you know, this dog has now practiced 20 minutes, which is in a tremendously long period of time for aggression. Um, anyway, to me, this is just abuse. And how unfair to that man. And you cannot, if your dog practices this anywhere in life, in your home, when you're not home, in your car, when you're not in the car, your dog is getting incrementally worse. And part of managing aggression is to manage the environment so your dog can't practice these behaviors. 
don't think she's done. And she's, I also think, guarding the, um, the park, but a lot of that is um, fear as well. And uh, in this dog park, it's a tourist attraction, and so families with kids come right up to the pen. Luckily, the black dog isn't right there. And again, you can see in her uh, approach, retreat, approach, retreat, charge forward, back off, charge forward, back up. Um, the pit bull says, in, the, in lieu of no owner being there, I am going to discipline you. Stop abusing that man. <laughs> Actually, the pit bull was just guarding her ball, but it was, it was at least somebody doing something. Did he ever say anything? The man, no. And unfortunately, I would imagine this happens all the time. And uh, the subculture in New York City, at the dog parks in New York City, which are notoriously the worst in the country, second only to California. But New York is worse because New York, um, they're the most congested because there are the most people and the smallest amount of real estate available for dog parks. So they're very small parks in general and way too many dogs. But the worst thing about New York City dog parks uh, um, they are always lined with benches, and the subculture in New York City is you bring your dog to the dog park, this is his village, this is his time to be a dog, and you're not to interrupt him. It's not for you to intervene, and you know, this is the lessons dogs need to teach each other. And that's a really dangerous um, belief or uh, myth. Um, and uh, so the dogs are, it's, it's, the, it's the worst. The best dog parks have no better dogs. They just have owners who stand up and intervene and interrupt and check in with their dogs. Um, anyway, um, this is, and again, this is the, um, the dog is more triggered when the guy is facing her and close up, but um, she's, uh, again, like fear-based here, and it goes on. And then this dog says, yeah, yeah, okay, that great idea. Let's chase the guy in uniform. And then everyone's in there. They're like, yeah, fantastic. And, you know, if that were my dog, I would, I'm, I'm sure, because I don't ever have luck, I would walk out of the park, and my black dog, after doing that for 20 minutes, would just bite the next man in a, in a uniform. But I'm sure, for the owner, it didn't do that. Uh, anyway, um, that's uh, one uh, thing of an example of stranger aggression, and uh, I'll talk more about that. And then, did somebody say Sue? No. Nope. Do I hear voices? I guess. <laughs> so let's look at predation. And um, if a wolf were going to go hunting, what would be the first, first, um, part of the sequence, the motor pattern of um, a hunting. Is it chase? Stop. No. The first thing is orient. Orient is um, your ears go forward and you make eye contact. And the next is eye, which is you lower your head and you fix your gaze. Then it's stalk, chase, grab, grab bite, head shake if they do it, um, kill bite, dissect. And many dogs have just parts of the sequence. They come in and, or they skip other parts. Um, and uh, so this is an Alaskan Husky. He's a sled dog, a mid-distance sprint racer, so he's huge. And he's got really short hair, so he wouldn't do well on the Iditarod Trail. Uh, but he's a fantastic mid-distance. Um, sprint dog. He has blue eyes, and everyone always thinks blue eyes are, you know, make it worse. And if that's true, how come no one has ever said to me that my eyes look aggressive or make me look meaner than, you know, my sister who has brown eyes? Um, his eyes are spooky because he's got pinprick pupils and he's in a whole predatory sequence. And if he had brown eyes, you would see it too. And he's trembling. 
And I know you see his tail tucked and you think, ah, oh, this is fear. And I don't think there's fear in what he's doing. Um, what I'll tell you about predation in dogs, whether it's to humans or um, other dogs, mostly you see it towards other dogs, it is very often triggered at a distance. So it makes it different than other forms of aggression. In other words, dogs who attack other dogs in a predatory way often spot a dog in the distance. It doesn't get triggered like status or sniffing or when they're actually meeting. You'll see the dog take a bead, orient, eye, some dog in the distance. It does not matter what the other dog is doing. It can be completely ignoring him. And then that's what triggers it. It can obviously be triggered closer up um, in the whole um, the sequence of it, but very often it is triggered at a distance. And there's a tongue flick. There's the eye, I mean the um, eye stalk. And then after this, it's a cascade of eye stalk chase, and then he hits the end of the leash. Is it a what? It's a dog. It's my dog, Hop Singh. Um, I use Hop Singh because um, he's 12 now. And I use him as um, the recipient dog, not because he's so great with dogs, but he doesn't um, react, he doesn't bark or lunge. And the reason why I can use him is he doesn't mind. Like most dogs with a dog staring at them, making them low on the food chain, they'd be scared, terrified. It would, over time, erode their good nature. Um, the, the life, the shelf life, of a tester dog, or you, you know, your dog that you use to work with or test dog aggression, they have a very short half-life. They, they can deteriorate really fast. And I use Hopsing because most of the time he's just super suicidal. He's just like, bring it on. You know, and he just looks. So maybe I've made him more high-ranking as time goes on, but he was just standing there looking at this dog, completely unfazed. <laughs> 